Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's hearing. I'm Council Member Carlina Rivera. I am chair of the Committee on Hospitals, and I'd like to start off by acknowledging my colleagues and fellow members of the committee, Council Member Reynoso, Council Member Moya, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Levine, and Council Member Rosenthal. Today, the committee will examine the importance of culturally competent health care and our healthcare system helping to address the health disparities and inequities that persist in our city. The inequitable roots of our healthcare system stretch back to the incorporation of racist ideologies and subsequent faulty data and medical testing, and still impacts the way we perceive the pain, health, and well-being of people. These particularly ugly histories are important to acknowledge and understand if we hope to create a future that is more equitable and just for all. For example, in the 19th century, faulty medical testing performed by white male doctors sought to justify slavery through so-called scientific evidence, such as proving that people who are black, at the time slaves, have lesser lung capacity and therefore needed to do more labor to help improve their lungs. This socially informed medicine continued into the 20th century, particularly in Europe, but also in America, where eugenics and ethnically based experimentation was utilized to justify racism, anti-Semitism, and genocidal behavior. Throughout history, individuals with disabilities have been institutionalized, isolated, experimented on, and in many cases abused, all based on scientific and medical evidence that today we would find horrific and unconscionable. Though, many, though these may feel like anachronistic tales from a bygone era, the truth is that our medical school, healthcare, and scientific institutions still perpetuate great inequities and have more work to do to educate and ensure true cultural competency. Nationally, black people are 40% more likely to have high blood pressure and 30% more likely to die from heart disease than others. The prevalence of diagnosed diabetes is twice as high in Mexican-American and Puerto Rican populations than in the non-Hispanic white population. Individuals with limited English proficiency experience high rates of medical errors, have worse clinical outcomes, and receive lower quality of care by other metrics than their English-speaking counterparts. Studies have shown that individuals who identify as lesbians are not screened for cervical cancer as often as heterosexual women, even though there are higher rates of cervical cancer in the lesbian population. Transgender and gender nonconforming individuals are more likely to experience discrimination, marginalization, and poor physical and mental health outcomes, which can result in a variety of physical and mental health conditions. Adults with disabilities are four times more likely to report their health to be fair or poor than people with no disabilities, and adults with disabilities are less likely to receive needed medical care because of the cost of care. Of course, race, poverty, disability, gender, gender expression, and other identities can be intersectional. So inequities can impact a single individual in many, many ways. The same inequities exist in New York City. Black New Yorkers have the lowest rates of early diagnosis for both breast and cervical cancer. Black women are more likely to die from breast cancer than white women, even though white women in New York City have higher rates of breast cancer diagnosis than black women. Black pregnant people are 12 times more likely to die due to pregnancy-related causes than white pregnant people. Although colorectal diagnosis and deaths have decreased since 1994, black men and women in New York City are more likely to die from this type of cancer. Furthermore, colorectal cancer mortality illustrates wealth disparities. New Yorkers living in the poorest areas are more likely to die from colorectal cancer than those from the richest areas. This display of wealth disparity is greatest in the Asian population with a gap in mortality rate of 51% between wealthier and poorer areas. Diabetes is another health concern that disproportionately affects minority communities. Regardless of the poverty level of the neighborhood, black, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander populations have higher rates of diabetes than white populations. 
Furthermore, a survey of 359 people within the LGBTQ, TG, and CNB community by the City Comptroller's Office revealed that those who are transgender, gender non-conforming, and or gender non-binary are more likely to have less access to health insurance. People with disabilities experience worse health status than people without disabilities, partly due to inadequate access to care, which causes preventable health conditions. In 2014, 44.4% of New Yorkers with disabilities rated their health as fair or poor, compared to only 9.1% of those without disabilities. While the causes of these inequitable health outcomes are complex, culturally competent health care can play an important role in helping to address negative health outcomes. Recognizing this, H&H &H Health and Hospitals has made investments in training and language services to improve their delivery of culturally competent and linguistically appropriate services. H&H &H provides culturally competent training for all new staff as well as periodic ongoing trainings, and I look forward to hearing more about these trainings today. In 2016, H&H &H released a plan to enhance equitable care, which outlined their commitment to provide each individual patient with a positive experience and to raise the bar on equitable care. The report speaks to the importance of addressing health inequities and calls on healthcare staff to understand, take into account, and incorporate cultural differences and social determinants of health into their practice. While there is still a lot of work to be done, H&H &H has been recognized for these investments. This year, 23 of H&H's patient care locations across all five boroughs received the designation Leader in LGBTQ Healthcare Equality from the Human Rights Campaign Foundation, and it was the fourth consecutive year that H&H &H received this designation. In addition to these discussions, today we will hear Resolution 512, sponsored by Councilmember Rosenthal, which calls on New York State to require medical schools to train all students about implicit bias. Unlike explicit bias, where consciously held beliefs influence the way a person evaluates or behaves toward a certain group, implicit bias results from unconscious attitudes or stereotypes. Implicit bias training helps provide helps providers better understand the population they serve by helping clinicians become, become aware of their own biases. Our medical education system must incorporate meaningful and robust education on implicit bias, as well as health inequity and the racist, misogynistic, and overall bias underpinnings of our medical school system. I look forward to hearing testimony regarding this very important issue, and I thank you all again for being here today. I would like to ask Councilmember Rosenthal to make remarks on her resolution. Thank you so much, um, Chair Rivera. I really appreciate your convening this hearing. Um, the, the, this resolution stemmed from a hearing that the Committee on Women and Gender Equity had last year regarding um, maternal mortality and morbidity in New York City. And while I commend the city's Department of Health for being um, every day conscious of the uh, reality that black women die at a rate eight times higher than white women regardless of socioeconomic status during childbirth, there's so much more work to be done. Um, they, the Department of Health has been studying this issue for over a decade, and I do commend them for that. But, so this, this resolution stems from that hearing, and um, what, we, the, what we learned about at our hearing was the systematic discrimination that is ingrained into our society um, has, of course, this terrible effect on, on anyone who's, who's not a white male. And Hannah Nicole Jones, in her 1619 project, of course, made all of this systemic racism, explained it in every different um, area of our life so clearly. Um, as the chair mentioned, um, you know, this point about slavery um, is okay. Physicians validated slavery based on the fact that a black person's lungs uh, would be better served working in the field. Similarly, that a black person's skin 
was so thick that, that whippings um, would be tolerable. Um, given what we know now, it's imperative that all of us uh, strive to change our society from where it is now to where we need to be. Uh, one way is, is by training our medical providers who had previously been taught myths in order to justify slavery. Uh, we need to train them that that is uh, not only no longer true, but people must be aware of how it affects them in their day-to-day -day medical practice. And of course, this all similarly applies to anyone who is considered uh, other, who has been marginalized in our society. Uh, in hospitals in particular, we must be training not only our physicians, but all of those who volunteer, who greet people, who walk in the door, who are nurses, in any way take care of someone walking in the door. Um, I so appreciate the chair for having a hearing on this topic, for including my resolution, and uh, I look forward to hearing from the administration who I know is working diligently to um, reverse the, the scourge that is racism uh, in New York City. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. I'm actually gonna have Council Swayden. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And proceed. Thank you, Chair, uh, Chairperson Rivera, and good afternoon, um, Chairperson Rivera and members of the Committee on Hospitals. I am Matilde Roman, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals, and I'm joined by Dr. Michelle Allen, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer. On behalf of Health and Hospitals CEO, Dr. Mitchell Katz, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you to discuss the delivery of culturally competent and equitable healthcare services and the programs and initiatives at Health and Hospitals to provide culturally responsive healthcare. Health and Hospitals is a safety net for the uninsured and underserved in New York providing healthcare services to 1.1 million New Yorkers each year, 380,000 of whom are uninsured. Our mission is to provide care to everyone, regardless of ability to pay, immigration status, gender identity, disability, or national origin. As such, it is a crucial part of our mission to provide accessible, culturally and linguistically appropriate services to ensure full access to comprehensive and quality care for all New Yorkers. New York City is home to over three million immigrant New Yorkers. 50% of New Yorkers speak a language other than English at home. And nearly one million New Yorkers self-identify as a person with disability. This city is also home to the largest LGBTQ community in the nation and as such, providing culturally competent and accessible care is a business imperative. At Health and Hospitals, patients who receive care belong to many different racial and cultural backgrounds. An estimated 30% of patients served are limited English proficient, and more than 60% of patients self-identify as either Black, African American, Hispanic, Latino, or Asian. Health and Hospitals' provision of culturally competent, equitable health services are guided by an understanding of the important role of one's culture, race, class, age, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity in interpersonal and professional encounters in healthcare, an awareness of historical and sociopolitical factors such as racism, ableism, immigration patterns, and human rights violations and, their import and the impact on the health and well-being of minority population, and the value in collaborating with ethnic and racial minority community-based organizations 
to ensure appropriate responses to individual health needs. Health and Hospitals is a leader in providing culturally competent and linguistically appropriate services by investing in trainings and initiatives to provide care for all that is safe, responsive, and effective. Addressing the healthcare needs of immigrant New Yorkers through the issuance of an open letter to reassure immigrant New Yorkers that health and hospitals is a safe place to receive care and through our partnerships with Legal Health to offer legal services. We also make available multilingual materials and collaborate with community-based organizations with close ties to the Latino, West African, and Asian communities to promote our initiatives such as NYC Care which is a healthcare access program that guarantees low cost and no cost services to New Yorkers who do not qualify for or can afford health insurance. This ongoing process requires periodic assessment of the cultural competency of our workforce, ongoing evaluation of effectiveness of our diversity training programs, May I continue? Um, this ongoing process requires periodic assessment of cultural competency of our workforce, ongoing evaluation of the effectiveness of our diversity training programs, and formal and informal linkages with communities that our facilities serve. I want to take a moment to highlight a few key initiatives that sets New York City Health and Hospitals apart in providing culturally and linguistically appropriate services. So with respect to language access, Health and Hospitals offers free language services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, year round, in over 200 languages and dialects. We translate key patient documents such as consent forms and patient education materials into the top 13 languages requested by limited English proficient New Yorkers. In fiscal year 2018, Health and Hospital facilities received more than one million requests for interpretation <coughs> services that yielded 13 million interpretation minutes. System-wide initiatives to support communication for persons who are limited English proficient include making available language access resources to inform the public of the availability of free language services, tools to ensure quicker access to language ID desktop displays, and I speak card to support facilities in the delivery of language assistance services. Creating a centralized database system to collect language service usage and key performance metrics to monitor for quality assurance and effectiveness. And having a designated language access coordinator at each facility who is responsible for overseeing the provision of language services. LGBTQ affirming services is also greatly important for us. And in health and hospitals, we will continue to strive to provide patient-centered affirming care to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer, and transgender and gender nonconforming communities. For the fourth consecutive year, all qualifying facilities within the health system received the designation of leader in LGBTQ healthcare equality by the Human Rights Campaign. This designation demonstrates health and hospitals' strong commitment to LGBTQ health equity through our policies, programs, and ongoing training. We also have Pride Health Centers at Metropolitan, Woodhall, Bellevue, and Gouverneur, which provide general preventive care and mental health services, as well as gender-affirming care, such as hormone therapy or referrals to specialists. The Bridge Program at Spring Street offers medical, mental health, and other support services to LGBTQ youth and emerging adults. And at Metropolitan Hospital, we provide gender-affirming surgery. And in the past year, due to the support of the City Council, Health and Hospitals has launched the LGBTQ Community Engagement Initiative, focused on connecting, engaging, and, facilita and facilitating affirming services to New York City's LGBTQ, TGNC communities to improve access to affirming care. Access to care for individuals with disabilities. Health and Hospitals is required to comply with various federal, state, and local laws requiring accessibility for individuals with disabilities, including the Americans with Disabilities Act, 
the Rehabilitation Act, and the Affordable Care Act, among others. We also implement programs to ensure access through effective communication for individuals with disabilities, including those who are blind or have low vision and who are deaf or hard of hearing. Additionally, for the last several years, we've had strong collaboration with the Independence Care System, Women's Health Program, to provide competent and accessible care to women with disabilities. This important work was supported by city council funds, 2.5 million in capital funds to upgrade four facilities, Morrisania, Sydenham, Cumberland, and Woodhall, and 275,000 in discretionary funds, which will allow health and hospitals to continue its work with ICS. We also provide resources and training for our employees. Health and hospitals offer system-wide training on diversity and inclusion, cultural competency, LGBTQ health, unconscious bias, and interreligious awareness through distance learning, new employee orientation, annual in-service, and other in-person training such as grand rounds and small facilitated dialogues offered year-round. Improving maternal and infant health is also a top priority. In 2018, the First Lady and the former Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services announced New York City's first comprehensive plan to reduce maternal deaths and life-threatening complications of childbirth among women of color. The five-year plan aims to eliminate disparities in New York City's maternal mortality between black and white women, where the widest disparities exist, and reducing by half the number of several maternal morbidity events in the five boroughs. For health and hospitals, the plan includes enhancing maternal care at our facilities by focusing on four specific strategies. The first one is simulation trainings to assist health providers master skills to identify and respond to the top two causes of pregnancy-related deaths for women of color. The second is new maternal care coordinators who will assist an estimated 2,000 high-risk women the third is coordination of newborn and postpartum appointments. And lastly, new practices to, in primary care to identify women who are planning to have a child within six to 12 months. Additionally, health and hospitals increase screening for maternal depression through a partnership with Thrive NYC and DOHMH to enhance screening of pregnant women and new mothers in order to promote treatment of maternal depressions. And we're happy to announce that 10 of our acute care facilities have earned the prestigious baby friendly designation from the World Health Organization for promoting the highest level of care for infants through breastfeeding and promoting bonding between mother and baby. We also have implicit bias training. As the largest public health system in the nation, serving perhaps the most diverse city in the country, Health and Hospitals is committed to ensuring its staff is sensitive to the issues of health equity and that we are delivering truly equitable care. We've issued two new e-learning modules. One is entitled Impact of Unconscious Bias on Culture of Inclusion, and the second, Diversity and Inclusion, a Business Imperative. Additionally, we have engaged with Perception Institute, a leading organization who translates innovative mind science research on race, gender, ethnic, and other identities into workable solutions, usually in the form of workshops to reduce bias and discrimination and promote belonging. Health and hospitals will begin training health and hospitals board of directors and senior leaders this fall. Moreover, we are working with DOHMH to provide train the trainer implicit bias training through Rebirth Equity Alliance to provide training sessions across health and hospitals, as well as other hospitals participating in the DOHMH Maternal Hospital Quality, Quality Improvement Network. The trainings will focus on improving equity in childbirth, and this training will take place next month in October. I also want to highlight a number of culturally competence, competent, uh, competency programs specific in, at facilities such as the Medina Health Center, operated at Harlem Hospital, 
which offers quality medical services to the African community, mainly of whom are African immigrants and members of the Muslim community, the Alira Clinic at Jacoby, which provides culturally sensitive medical care to refugees from the Balkans, Elmhurst Hospital that operates the psychiatric inpatient units that address the needs of both Spanish-speaking patients and Asian patients who primarily speak Cantonese, Mandarin, and Korean, and Lincoln Hospital operates the Viva, the Viva Mujer, uh, Long Live Women, and Viva Los Hombres, Long Live Men, cancer outreach program that promotes public education in the areas of cancer screening, prevention, and early detection. In conclusion, at New York City Health and Hospitals, we believe all New Yorkers, regardless of disability, national origin, gender, or citizenship status, deserves equitable, affordable care of the highest quality. And true to our mission, health and hospitals will continue to provide health services in a culturally responsive manner to meet the needs of the city's diverse population. I thank you for your interest and attention, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Great, thank you. I just want to um, acknowledge that we were joined by Councilmember Matthew Eugene, and we've been joined by Councilmember Alan Lizo. So I want to ask a couple questions um, about some of the things you mentioned in your testimony. So we'll go right into the implicit bias training piece. And it seems just by kind of what I've heard that you are working on a number of training sessions and, and workshops, I think what you call workable solutions, and that you really are trying to address some of the issues that I pointed out in my testimony and that you just see every single day con considering the very diverse population that we have. You mentioned here that we have made available to staff all year two e-learning modules and that you are also working with the Perception Institute um, on workable solutions, usually in the form of workshops. So which one of these trainings, are any of them mandatory? So currently we're working on integrating. So our um, trainings that are mandatory are in our new employee orientation programs and our annual in-service. And in what the, was the second one, the annual in-service. So all employees have to take annually a suite of training content, um, and that's mandatory. What part of the strategy for health and hospitals is really to thread and integrate many of these key components into training. So we have standalone trainings, such as the one we mentioned, um, but we also look for opportunities to augment and supplement existing training so that at any point um, where individuals are exposed to training, they also are able to partake in culturally competent best practices um, and other topics related to diversity and inclusion. So the goal would be is that we're, the hope is to integrate um, many of this content um, to help support learning on, on an ongoing basis. I know that we're going to hear from um, a lot of ins many institutions that train some of our doctors, um, and I, I believe that New York City is probably top of the nation in terms of training our medical students. So, but what I'm hearing is that so you have a new employee orientation and an annual in-service uh, training that is a suite of trainings, correct? So are any of those specifically addressing cultural competency and implicit bias, and are they mandatory? I just want to make sure I understand. Thank you for that question. So in the new employee orientation is offered system level that's to, uh, available to all employees, new employees. We also have a new employee orientation at the facility level. We embed these training components into those training suites, so they happen, they're, they're blended training, so there's live sessions as well as e-learnings. And so we integrate components of our work in the diversity and inclusion space to include that. 
We also have standalone trainings. The one I mentioned was the unconscious bias and diversity inclusion business imperative. Those are standalone trainings that individuals can access year round and we enroll individuals on an ongoing basis um, so that they can also avail themselves of that training as well. Um, the Perception Institute um, is a, a training that is, is, is being offered um, now for senior level staff as well as um, and cabinet members. And, and so I would defer to um, Dr. Allen to elaborate just for a minute. I just want to make sure we swear the, the, the panel in. Do we swear you in? Yeah, I would love to, whoever, I would love to talk to all of you if it's appropriate. So I'm Dr. Michelle Allen, Chief Medical Officer of the Health and Hospital System. I'm Dr. Wendy Wilcox, um, Chief of OBGYN at Kings County Hospital, as well as the Clinical System Lead for Women's Health. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you asked about implicit, uh, the perceptions, uh, training that we're offering and for implicit bias. So, and let me give you a little more information. Okay. So what I want to know is what is the curriculum like? If it's not mandatory, if it's optional, I hear that some things are mandatory in the new employee training. And I imagine that you cover cultural competency just given alone the diverse population that we serve and the languages that are spoken inside of your facilities. What, I, what I'm trying to get to is whether or not some of these trainings are in fact mandatory for any of the employees. You have, a, you have many, many employees. What percent of them are actually trained in cultural competency and or implicit bias? And I realize there are many titles for what we imagine is the same curriculum. Because what we also will ask in a minute is for those people that have taken the training, whether or not they're mandatory or even the optional ones, what are the outcomes like? Are you tracking those outcomes facility-wide but also one-on-one? -on -one? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to divide the question or our responses into two. Um, so Matilda shared with you what we're doing for our staff which is our entire staff. Mm -hmm. um, what Dr. Wilcox will speak to is what we're doing for our maternal child health staff. Um, and we're also collaborating with uh, DOHMH with an implicit bias training as well. So what I'd like to do is first describe what you asked at the curriculum, what will be covered, um, and the logistics of the training and what we're doing with implicit, with perceptions. We're starting at very senior level with the board of directors and the senior cabinet. And do you want to take it from there? And after they receive their training this fall, we have a plan to roll it out to the 11 acute care facilities to train the leadership, both clinical, executive level administration, nursing, department heads, as well as a cross section of the staff, including frontline staff and learners. So at the moment, the concept is to cover everybody. The concept. So right now, how many are trained? We're beginning in October and November, October for the senior cabinet and November for the board of directors. And once we have educated the senior leaders, because it's really imp imperative that we lead and model the behavior and really Implicit bias is so subtle and insid insidious that none of us know or are aware of. So we really like to make everybody aware of their own judgmental assumptions and decisions that they make. And we really want to start at the very senior level with the board of directors um, and get their buy-in and support to spread. After we do the senior leaders, then October, senior cabinet, November, board of directors, and then a rollout with the senior leadership of each facility and then spread down from there. So it'll probably be a nine month process to do the entire system. Our focus is maternal child health, but we're also going to be looking at all of our staff. Hilda from Human Resources, we have online training 
um, which is track. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you just want to speak to the tracking and. Yes. So all our trainings, whether they're in person or through distance learning, are tracked through our learning management system. Um, and so, you know, we can count how many at each facility have taken our any any training. So you're you're tracking who's going to be receiving the training, correct? Because from what I understand, you're launching October, November, yeah. and you're starting at the top. Yeah. And you have a nine-month timeline to train every single person employed by Health and Hospitals. Is that correct? Nine months. About nine months, yeah. Just a point of correction. We, the nine months okay. is going to be for board members, senior leaders across our 11 acute facilities with the intent in nine months to auto-enroll additional front patient-facing staff um, and direct care providers in our 11 acute facilities. I think that is something that's manageable in the nine months period. Ultimately, I think everyone here, and I imagine that people from your administration and from h, &H are gonna stay for the entire duration of the hearing in order to hear the testimony of some of the people in this room who are consumers and advocates and they're gonna be sharing some very personal experiences is that every single person in a facility should be trained on a cultural competence and implicit bias. I mean, your visit starts at reception. You know, your interaction with uh, a custodian or with a physician's assistant or a nurse's assistant, there are so many people that work inside of your 11 acute facilities and the Gotham network that we wanna make sure that you have the support that you need and that you have a real plan because you also mentioned in your testimony uh, your focus on maternal mortality, and there was an announcement by the First Lady in 2018, and that, that was a five-year plan. Right. How far along are you in the plan? Are you tracking outcomes? Are you, are you set on that timeline? I, I'm trying to, I really want to grasp, and I want the people in, in this room and the public to know exactly how we're looking at healthcare and how we're focusing on this, which is leading to some horrific outcomes in this city, not just nationwide, not just in the poorest areas, but I have, I, I read aloud some alarming statistics that no matter where you live, sometimes it is just the color of your skin or the first language that you speak at home that is attributing to some really, really terrible outcomes for some of our patients and that is unacceptable. So our maternal morbidity and mortality plan is actually a five-prong plan, um, as you mentioned. Um, and thank you for that question. It's something that's very close to our heart and we're passionate and committed to implementing. Um, we have order, re and as you heard in the testimony, there are five prongs, one of which is simulation training to train all the obstetricians uh, around the two leading causes of death, which is cardiac arrest during labor as well as postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, to date, we've trained 60% of all of maternal child health staff, and the goal is by December, 100%. Um, we are also have placed in primary care a pregnancy intention question. So if you look at maternal morbidity and mortality, often it's those women who access care late, who've not been in primary care, and have not had the opportunity to have their chronic medical conditions actually addressed and controlled. So starting in the, for those patients who are in primary care clinic with chronic medical conditions, to ask every woman of reproductive age who's in primary care clinic, are they planning a pregnancy within the next year? If they are planning a pregnancy within the next year, referring them to OB clinic uh, with with the intent to really fine tune their diabetes, their hypertension, the pulmonary hypertension, et cetera. If they're not planning a pregnancy within, and this has already been implemented, that it sits in our electronic medical record. So if a woman has chronic, di chronic diabetes or chronic hypertension and she's not planning pregnancy to make sure she gets to her gynecologist to have effective birth control. So we want women who are planning on becoming pregnant to be their healthiest and best control in terms of their chronic conditions, and those who are not planning to make sure they have effective contraception. We've also have another prong, which is, provide, is standing up a 
maternal medical home, very similar to what we have in primary clinic, primary care clinic, so that we're enhancing our social support systems within the clinic and building our community outreach workers and our connections with our community-based organizations, understanding that a lot of complications of pregnancy we can't treat in the office. If there are social conditions, access to food, access to babysitters, transportation, et cetera, that impact the outcome of the pregnancy. I also mentioned simulation. Another fact is about 40% of prenatal patients actually do not follow up with their postpartum visit, but they in fact do keep their pediatric visits. So we're co-locating and coordinating the postpartum visit with the well baby visit. Queens is our model for that. They actually have two models for that. One is absolute co-location on the Saturday clinic or an evening clinic when they actually have the ability and the resources to do that. Or they have sequential visits that there's a pediatric visit followed up by a postpartum visit on the same day. So that's what we've initiated to date. I'm glad that you mentioned the community-based organizations, and specifically, I know that you are working, you mentioned in the testimony uh, with ICS on really making sure that there is true and equitable access for people with disabilities. When you're working with community-based organizations, how do you find them? Because I think, you know, what you mentioned is that people aren't seeking care as early as they should with something as serious as a pregnancy. So with these community-based organizations, how, how are you kind of finding them and how are you working with them? And, and the other reason why I ask is because we have a very toxic anti-immigrant administration in Washington that is day after day putting forward proposals that is scaring our immigrant communities and some of our poorest New Yorkers from entering public trusted spaces, including our hospitals. So if it's hard to get them in the door and they weren't seeking the early treatment and, and support to begin with, what are you doing to make sure that you are constantly working with the trusted nonprofits in, the, in these neighborhoods to, to make sure that that outreach is, is, is 100%? Chairperson, may I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Is it specific to the mat maternal women, or is it much more broader, your, your scope of questioning? I actually would like to hear about both. I think the maternal mortality is, is, is those, those rates continue to be, I think, what is, is just shameful in terms of our reputation. And, and they had this, this hearing that Council Member Rosenthal mentioned but we know that as, as much as we're trying, we're still failing our black and brown mothers and, and, and parents and families. And it honestly, we, we, when we mention socioeconomic factors, it, it is true, but I can't help but, but come back to the thought of when someone as rich and famous as Serena Williams isn't heard, you know we have a problem, right? She can't even access the care that she needs. Right. And this is not the average person. So when people come to me and they say, you know, I, I'm afraid, I'm unenrolling in benefits, I wanna make sure that whether you're pregnant or not, or whether you wanna start a family, that is your own choice, that people have trusted CBOs that they're going to. And so I guess my question is, regardless of the sector of care, regardless of whether it's getting pregnant or treatment for your diabetes, how are you finding these community-based organizations and how are you working with them? So we've actually started in Brooklyn, um, working with the three other obstetrical hospitals in Brooklyn um, and brought a consortium of community-based organizations together to meet with us, recognizing the particular challenges in central Brooklyn. Um, we met with LaRae Brown um, and other hospital leaders, Kings County, SUNY Downstate, Brookdale, and invited the community leaders, Ngozi, uh, Moses joined us, uh, midwives from the community joined us, doulas from the community joined us, and we started to actually work out a plan how to move forward to improve access of women in the community who are fearful of coming to the big house hospital, but are actually going to the community providers. And we wanted to start there in Brooklyn to build those connections with the community support using doulas and midwives to help us engage 
with the citizens of Brooklyn. Well, that's excellent. And I, I know we had um, a hearing recently talking about the importance of doulas, and I'm very interested in holding a hearing on, on midwives and their work and how we can redefine who midwives serve, because I don't think it's just, it's not just female, right? These are our TGNC and B individuals. So does H&H &H have any permanent staff who are charged with overseeing these trainings, making sure that people are not just getting the trainings, but they know that some of those e-modules are available? And is there any incentive to, to get people to take these trainings? I want to believe that every person working in a hospital wants to take these trainings, but I also know that we have a lot going on and we want to make sure that we're holding the entire uh, employee system accountable? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, so we have, um, within health and hospitals, a chief learning officer for the system. Um, and their team is really investing in building training to support capacity building of staff. And um, I, I work closely with the chief learning officer and their team, Dr. Allen, and all the uh, other clinical leads work closely with the chief learning officer um, to really ensure that we are providing um, up-to-date uh, best practices and building the skills and competencies of our workforce. Um, so thank you for that because we actually have a dedicated team that works across the system to support learning and development. Uh, how large is the team? I'm sorry if I missed Oh, that. I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's, a, it's a sizable team. Um, they have training facilitators. Um, they help support con uh, content with our subject matter experts. Um, they develop in-house in the, the learning management and support the learning management systems that we have. Um, and uh, we, they support us even with in-person live sessions that happen across the system at each facility. In November 2018, we held a hearing on TGNC NB uh, healthcare services. Mm -hmm. And we heard from uh, a lot of amazing advocates in the work that they were doing. And we had, a, I, I guess, a, I would say a big budget win in 2019 to make sure that we had healthcare navigators for this community. Mm -hmm. So since then, H&H &H launched 14 unique training opportunities for staff that relate to creating affirming env environments for TGNC people, patients, families, employees. And we have here the number six, 16,264 unique staff have taken at least one of these trainings. Now, I don't know what the numbers are as of today, but is your goal to have 100% of the employees trained in this? Thank you. Do you have a timeline? Thank you for your question. So um, good news to report is that we've added two new training modules. So we have 16 unique training opportunities for staff that relates to creating affirming environments for TGNC people. And to date, we have trained upwards of over 20,000 uh, unique staff um, on one or more trainings that gets us approximately 60%. And our goal really, as I had stated earlier, is to really integrate training on cultural competency, LGBTQ affirming services in a way um, that everyone has access and is exposed to this content year round. We don't wanna look at this as one-offs. Um, because we believe that it's really important to continue providing and reinforcing best practices throughout the year. How do you handle complaints about cultural insensitivity? So complaints in general are, are managed and handled um, via in accordance with federal regulation. Um, at each facility, we have patient guest relation teams um, that mission really is to serve as advocates for patients um, and manage complaints. Um, and so the, 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 the way that complaints are received is that patients will connect with the patient representative. Um, most complaints are resolved as quickly as possible, but within 24 hours um, for instances where they may be a bit more complex or require more time. 
by federal regulation, we have to uh, acknowledge and respond to the patient within seven days. How do you track and analyze them? They are tracked, um, they are all tracked and they go through our QA on a quarterly basis. And so does, as you gather this data, um, there is someone there to analyze them to see how you could refine, improve the trainings and some of the care that you're providing? Absolutely, and most of the complaints that we receive are really service related issues, uh, such as like I haven't seen my doctor. And so that's something that's quickly triaged within a matter of hours. So if there's a patient who wants to see their doctor, they would speak to the patient relations office and the, the patient relations rep would then connect uh, the patient with their physician and the matter is resolved. So many of the complaints that we do receive from our patients are things that we can manage and resolve within a very quick period of time. You said that most of the complaints you said are service related. Mm -hmm. um, how many complaints do you typically receive? I don't have a specific number but I know that the vast majority of the, of the complaints that we receive are service related and are resolved rather quickly. They're resolved within 24 hours, but I don't have any specific numbers for you at this time. And you can absolutely break them down to better tailor some of the trainings? I haven't been able to um, analyze it to that level of detail, but what I do understand is that um, many of the complaints receive or something that um, we are able to resolve quickly um, and with very little effort um, by our patients. And how are patients informed of their rights and how to complain in the grievance process? That's a great. So we have posted in our in conspicuous locations across our like waiting areas uh, our, the list of the list of patient relation contact information. I also serve as the civil rights coordinator for patient services for the system, and so they can directly con con connect with our office. But if people don't feel comfortable in submitting a grievance or a complaint within health and hospitals, we also have listed uh, the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights and their process for receiving complaints, which can be by telephone, via email, or by completing the form if you download it. And so we have, um, based on regulations, uh, have to post this and it's available to patients. When you mentioned the service-related complaints, would a person's spoken language ever cause a delay in receiving care? We so for the system, we monitor language services through my office. So um, I am the business owner for language services across the system. Um, we monitor daily um, our connection times, our wait times, and inequality issues. We have monitoring and auditing tools in place that allow uh, our end users, which is our providers, to provide us with real-time feedback, and we get that immediately. And so really, it's an opportunity for us to always evaluate and assess the effectiveness of language services because that is a top priority for us because it speaks um, directly to quality and safety of our patients. So when you sit down with a patient and you're doing an intake, for example, do you ask, or do you collect data on racial or ethnic groups? Do you ask people if they have a disability? What kind of personal information is collected? Demographic, is in, uh, demographic information is collected. At point of intake, we have uh, race, ethnicity. We collect if an interpreter is needed and the language in which interpretation services is required. Um, and that's how we connect individuals with services. And we have a variety of different methods in how we deliver language assistance services to our patients to ensure, because it's, it's not a one size fits all approach. And so we ask the question, you know, what is the preferred method of communicating with your doctor or your nurse? Do you ask if they have a disability? We do. Um, and we have in our demographic information fields that allow for us to annotate that on the record. 
And you mentioned you are trying to use this data to inform the quality of care you're providing, correct? Correct, and as, as, and as you know, we are slowly migrating into our new electronic medical record um, that we hope to have fully phased in by the end of calendar year 2019. And the goal for us would be is that as we have all our facilities in using the same electronic medical record and we continue forward in training staff on using um, the new electronic medical record that we're we're going to strengthen the demographic information that's going to be able to inform prevention, intervention, and our practices within our healthcare delivery. No, it's exciting. The, for anyone that doesn't know, the electronic medical records, EPIC, is going to be officially live in all of the facilities by December 8th, I think? December. December I know it was 7th or 8th. I, I tell my calendar. So there's a lot of training and um, learning that needs to happen, but we believe that it, as we have integrated into this standard electronic medical record that our data is gonna get stronger and that data is gonna inform our work better. And, and that's great, because I know you had three different systems and they weren't talking to each other and every hospital was using something else. So this is streamlined and it sounds like it's, it's going to be, I guess pun intended, epic, right? Yes. So, uh, but the, the, the data that you're collecting right now, and, and you're, you know, you're using it to inform the services that you provide, mm -hmm. do you, uh, I, I just want to make sure that, that, that you're refining some of your services, right? That you're using it to make sure that if you receive a, a population that speaks a certain language here, clearly you need to find a doctor or a nurse or a, an interpreter 24 hours a day that speaks that language. Or if you notice that people with disabilities have heard that the services at Morrisania are outstanding and they continue to come to your facility because they've helped advocate for some of those changes, mm -hmm. that you're making sure that it is some of the, the, the best equipment, the, the, the best services that they can receive. Can you give me a couple of examples of how you use some of this data that you're tracking to measure and then improve outcomes? So I could speak with respect to language services um, and how, how we track uh, language use informs us of new and em in emerging languages within specific geographic locations in which we're providing services. Um, and then we work closely with our vendors to help source um, interpreters to fill the need. Um, I know that um, in our work with ICS, um, they have been instrumental in identifying opportunities for improvement, um, and we have been working closely with them to retrofit a number of our exam rooms um, and our diagnostic um, areas in order for us to uh, uh, create greater improvement um, for women um, who have mobility issues. Um, so those are some, some two, two quick examples of the work, but I think the data says one thing, and I think part of the, the larger story for us is that you know, we are engaged with the community in ways that inform what we're doing well and where we still need to improve, and, and so that's something that happens ongoing. Um, Dr. Katz meets regularly with communities, um, so that he can himself listen uh, to their concerns and challenges. Um, and so we're very much open to really understanding how, as a system, we can do better. I, I believe that you all are very earnest in your approach to this. And I, I think my, my one kind of question, and I'm, I, I want to make sure again that I understand that you continue to make sure that in your new employee orientation and your annual in-service meetings that people receive culturally competent, uh, uh, cultural competency training as well as implicit bias, information, materials, resources, correct? That you're working on a fuller, more comprehensive plan that will launch this fall, in which you're starting at the top right. and hoping to, at some point down the line, train every single person in your facility. Is that correct? Yes. Everyone, right? From reception to the aides to the doctors? 
Maybe not by tomorrow, but at some point, right? That is the goal. The goal is is that at, at the point of entry to the point of discharge that people are receiving affirming com competent care throughout the continuum of care. We've trained hospital police on LGBTQ sensitivity. We are training clerical staff on how to ask soldier related questions that are respectful. Mm -hmm. um, we're training our community health workers on health literacy and cultural competency. We have in-service uh, uh, cultural competency components embedded. We have so also in our in-service and it is um, true to say and, I'm, and I have high confidence in saying to you that it's our goal is to always make sure that on an ongoing basis that our staff are receiving culturally competent training. And just to add to that, Chair, Chairwoman Rivera, as we're building curriculum that are not specifically about implicit bias, so as we're building curriculum and simulation, shoulder dystocia, postpartum hemorrhage, that implicit bias is included mm -hmm. and embedded in our academic courses as well. And I just want to add that I think you would have the support of the medical community if you, you know, go on record and say that these, these trainings, they should be mandatory, that they should not be optional, that it is far too late in the game and we're far too long in history with, with things that we have to acknowledge that we've done, we've done them unjustly, and we really have to correct um, so much in, in delivering what is a basic human right. I, I just want to thank you. I know that um, I've asked you a lot of questions about why isn't it mandatory and why is this optional or why isn't this up and running. I realize it takes a ton of coordination, but I want to just thank you for being here. Uh, there are many hospitals with far more resources than H&H &H who decided to not attend this hearing, and I don't believe Greater New York it will be in attendance today to deliver their testimony, and I know for a fact that they have uh, far more of a, a better capacity considering the patient population that you're serving. So I want to thank you uh, for answering as honestly as possible and for all your work and dedication. And I really want to stress that you and uh, your team stick around as long as possible because we're going to hear from some amazing people. And thank you so much for your thank testimony. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for addressing this topic. It's paramount for us. It's excruciatingly important. We see it every day in every service. So I just want to thank you personally for holding this hearing. Thank you. We are going to call up Marilyn Saviola, Claire Abenante, Rosa Maria Ocasio, and Michaelin Brink. Uh, Branker, and you can feel free to correct me on the names so I have my name mispronounced all the time and I'm sensitive to that. and Mannion Lyons also. No apology necessary, don't worry about it. 
I just want everyone to be as comfortable as possible, and if you need anything, you just let us know. My name is Marilyn Saviola, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Advocacy and Women's Health at ICS, and I am honored to be at this hearing, and want to thank by thanking Council Coleman for calling the hearing, and our staff and the work they've done with us. Thank you. Um, a lot of things I want to skip my testimony, but a lot because I want to respond to some things that the H agency H presented. Let me begin with saying that we have an excellent relationship with that. We started um, a women's health program to people with disabilities in 2007. And we got a grant, and our, our thing with you is that from my, from my background, from my life, from my peers, friends, and colleagues, plus our membership, that people were not getting women's health care, specifically uh, a mammogram. For those of you who are old enough to have mammograms, picture myself getting a mammogram. Or picture Rosie, someone who has trouble with balance to me. Or a mammogram. And so we all got our own challenges. It took, so we got a grant from the coma race to cure. To, to identify and address the barriers that prevent women with physical disability from getting mammograms and other screenings. And um, it, we're not oncologists, we're not breast surgeons, and we're not radiology professionals. But we are disability competent as an organization. And let's go down there. We are... Uh, Excuse me one second. So we got this grant. So we had to find a partner site that did breast cancer screening that would work with us. And uh, like that, it took us five and a half months in New York City to find one facility that would work with that. Everyone, we would go, the sites were either inaccessible because you couldn't get in the building, you couldn't get in the examining room, the machine, the bucket that you put your breast in and didn't go down low enough to accommodate someone sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, or so they didn't have the machinery at all. Nor the disability competent training. And they were in, uh, concerned about how much money they would lose because they're only reimbursed for a 15 minute period to get breast cancer screening done. Uh, I had lost a dear friend who had breast cancer and had cerebral palsy and couldn't get a mammogram, screening mammogram done until the growth was so big you could see it from outside her breast. She unfortunately died a very painful death, all because there was no accessible program that she was aware of. Um, Independence Care System is a program that works with people with disabilities to provide the services we need to live in the community and participate in the community lives where parents, where lovers, where part of, we work, we, we raise children just like anybody else. And any illness that occurs is compounded by a physical disability. And 
things like that. So it's all that. Oh, people don't know that. Okay, thank you. The segment, the care for people with disabilities is very segmented. Peer specialist, up until uh, a few years ago, I got my primary care from my neurologist because she knew about my disability. She knew what she had to look for. Uh, many of us uh, who became disabled as children saw pedi pediatricians in their 40s because they had no one else that would take them. Um, and you know, you were talking before about uh, the incidents, prior incidents of death and stuff that in breast cancer, there is not a higher incidence of breast cancer in the population of, what, of people with disabilities, women with disabilities, but they have almost four times higher death rate, and a mortality rate. And why do you think this is? Well, the obvious reason is because places are not accessible. People that don't know where to go. The more dangerous is that people with disability are not given aggressive treatment the way an able-bodied woman was. So someone makes a value judgment that someone's life may not be happy for a while. And why waste our resources? Go on make them suffer more and have to have go to a mammogram. So it can become for make go to the point of view to a bad point of perspective. Now uh, what happened when someone I'll use my friends for myself. Go to a doctor. Well, or, or wait till someone like myself testifies at a hearing with the Department of Health. I'm their biggest nightmare because they don't. This is the seat all the hiding is hiding part. In the population of people with physical disabilities with high end users of the system are the ones who are, are not getting the services. And in, the, in about 1907, uh, when we started this program, and we found partners, first at the uh, Columbia uh, Presbyterian Avon's, uh, Avon Breast Center. Uh, it was our first site that worked with us, and then we moved in to the, uh, to, uh, the Harlem Breast Center. But we couldn't get into H&H, &H, and we had many, uh, different meetings with different people, and we were asked to go up to Lincoln Hospital because Lincoln had just gone in a brand new radiology suite for mammography, and they thought the machines were better. So we went up, we viewed them, we surveyed them. We went in and we talked to people and they tried to, they set up a meeting where the ICS staff could go in and talk about why we needed this. And um, the meeting must have been canceled three or four times, which had been the pattern that developed in the facilities. We asked to see as soon as they thought about us and the money it would cost. So, uh, we're doing our presentation, and, and usually it was the chief radiologist uh, from the Women's Health Program uh, for breast cancer radiology. But this time, there's also the chief of primary care, uh, the chief of managed care, and uh, the chief medical officer. And she got up in the room and she said, you know, I, I'm really upset. This is, uh, here I am. I'm a primary care doctor. And there's a white elephant in this room. And the white elephant is, why well, you're only looking 
at a woman's breast. Why aren't you looking at her whole body? So therefore, I don't think you should call it that. And so we thought we were blown away, but we weren't. It was the best thing that happened to us because she referred us to Morris St. Nick Diagnostic and Treatment Center, which is our first and community facility where they literally welcomed us. I said, you could really help train us because we don't, we do this, but we know we're not doing it well. And so what we did was we did surveys and we do trainings on disability competency and awareness and sensitivity. The awareness and sensitivity is given to everyone in the women's health area who require, uh, who have direct contact with patient care. And it's a long training, but it's done. And we actually did make a video with H and H. In fact, I would say uh, about 2010, 2011, which was supposed to be used as our, orient, our orientation employees. We didn't like the video. They didn't like the video. Um, the people in the video didn't like the video, so it didn't get very far. It's something we need to revisit. Uh, the other thing is now we're about to go into primary care with, with the help of the health and hospitals, actually, with, uh, particularly Ted Long is helping with in his staff to uh, get this done. We, right now we have five sites for an HH that are disability Access, disability friendly, they're not ADA accessible because we don't have the money to do that. But they're usable if you make simple changes and all. More of a 504 standard to accessibility. With the goal that as they renovate, they become more and more accessible. And, and that was both the big thing to do. The other thing is, is to realize that uh, no one is taught about, doctors aren't taught about it. I mean, uh, our program does some training at medical schools, but it's elective one night late after class that you come to me talk about what we do. So right now, we have the commitment of the health plan of H&H to move ahead and start primary care, which is the next thing, because that's where the money-saving costs are. That's where you do think people with disabilities don't get flu shots. They don't get pneumonia shots. It's not because they don't have a primary care doctor. They go see their neurologist who doesn't have it. You know, that type of stuff in the office usually. So well, we have to deal with that. We then are. Well, I was I was going to mention that it it's, it speaks to a lot of the work that you have been doing. I mean, they specifically mention the independence care system, um, you know, in their testimony and and all of the work. I guess collaboratively that you've been able to to accomplish all of the things that you've been able to accomplish. And, and for me, I, I, you answered a lot of my questions in your, in your testimony in terms of your perspective and your experience, and I think that we all agree in, in why the, the honor is mine to, to hold this hearing and to have you talk a little bit about personal experience and, and how long you've been working at this issue. Is that right? We do not want cultural competency training or implicit bias classes to be an elective. It, it's, it's, that's non-negotiable. That's not where we're at, and we have we have a long way to go. So I know that you have a, a number of other yeah, other I, uh, advocates with you, correct? Okay. And thank you, thank you so much. Good morning, and God bless you. My name is Manion Lyons, and I've had, and I want to explain why it is very important to include people with disability in the resolution 51512. I have cerebral palsy since birth. My main 
my main sy symptoms for me is severe spasticity. Because of my disability, I've had a lot of bad experience in trying to get health care. Some of this is due to the physical barriers. I've been, I've, I've, I've been to doctor's office and have not, and have not been able to get on a, a adjustable table. I have struggled to get out of my chair and climb on the table, which is not safe, which is not a safe thing for me to do. However, a lot of the problem is the bias against people like me. I have very, I have been very, no, I have been very badly treated. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, medical by medical professionals because of my disability. For example, I, when I was brought into the doctor's office, the doctor would often talk to my aide instead of me. Let me give an example. They would look at her and say, how is she doing? Why is she here? That's insulting. Do I, sound, do I look or sound like I can't speak for myself? You never know, you don't know me, but just looking at me, do I really look like I can't speak for myself? Okay, when I was pregnant with my son, that's another story, the social worker asked me, why do you wanna keep your baby? My first pregnancy, my only pregnancy, thank you, Jesus. My sister-in-law was with me, and she was, up, she was very upset. I had to more calm her down than me. Thank God. I said, my mother kept me, so why wouldn't I keep my baby? Then, one time, I went to the neighborhood, cl the neighborhood clinic for my, for my pregnancy, and they referred me right away to a high-risk clinic, another hospital just because they saw the wheelchair. They didn't, ask, they, they didn't ask me or didn't investigate did I have high blood pressure or were my feet swollen. So I went to another hospital and then, um, then at, the high risk, at the high risk clinic for pregnancy, the doctor said, why are you here? I didn't have high blood pressure or my feet weren't swollen. So they, again, they just looked at my wheelchair. Okay, if this, ha if, this doesn't ch if this doesn't change, what will happen? If things like this don't change, what will happen to people like me? What happened to a very close friend of mine, it, she, was, she also had a disability and she developed breast cancer. But by the time they found out, it was too late and she passed away. No one should have to die from a late diagnosis or by a medical profession doesn't think that, I, that your life matters just because you have a disability. But too often, it's just the way it is. I'm here today because I want things, I want things to be very different and teach doctors about not to have bias against people with disabilities, it's important that is why it is important to take these steps. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rosa Maria Casio. I am a mother and grandmother with disabilities. My disabilities began in 1997 when I was working as a nurse's aide and also a home care aide. I was injured on the job, followed by another accident in my home. I have permanent disabilities involving my neck, my back, my arm, my legs, my foot, and in some places my bones are fused together. I can't move far without a walker and I have a lot of pain, constant pain, put it this way. It is important that people with disabilities can see ourselves in Resolution 512 because we endure tremendous bias and discrimination in healthcare. These attitudes are everywhere. For example, until I was able to get a mammogram with the help of independent care system, I'm having trouble holding it up. 
My experiences trying to get a breast cancer screening were horrible. I have a very hard time getting into position for the mammogram machine. I wear braces on both of my legs. I can't put all of my weight on either one of them. And I have to shift from side to side. To get a mammogram, I have to be still. And I also have to lean over, which with a back problem is very hard to do. And if I do so, for a long time, I go into back spasms in my lower back. And allow me to add, I've also had RSD to my left hand. I have, uh, yeah, I'm getting nervous. I also I have, have to get nervous, an extension. Okay. I also have an extension of a 45 degree angle to my right forearm. With experiences, was so terrible because of the mammography technicians. I didn't understand my condition. Didn't ask appropriate questions and basically let me know that I was a burden to them. I've even been called. Um, what's the word that I put there? Uncompliable. They, yeah. Well, they assume I was unwilling to cooperate when all I was trying to do was trying to accommodate my body so it wouldn't hurt so much. They were very impatient and would rush me and as a result for years I had to worry because I could not get a valid mammogram. The results always came back inconclusive. That is not a good medical care. And I know that it's a direct result of bias because ever since ICS, Independent Care System, helped me with finding a disability com what? competent doctors who actually treat me as an individual and work with me and my condition, I've been able to get the proper breast cancer screenings. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Micheline Branker. I'm a registered nurse and a certified nurse midwife. I have a spinal cord injury which happened in 1993 as a result of surgery gone wrong. After I became disabled, I applied for a job as a school nurse, which I was completely qualified for. However, the nurse who I would have been working with at the school called the district area supervisor to say that she didn't believe I would be able to perform in the job because of my disability. Even after I went for a trial at the school and demonstrated that I was fully able to carry out the responsibilities of that job, I was not hired due to my disability. At first, it was incredible to me that I would be discriminated against in this way by another nurse. But in retrospect, I should not have been surprised because as a medical professional myself and someone who spent my career in the medical field, I'm all too aware of the bias that people with disabilities face when seeking health care. I'm here today to urge the council to rewrite the resolution 512 to broadly and specifically include people with disabilities. In fact, in my opinion, it should be aimed not only at medical school students, but to those in nursing schools and other programs that train medical assistants, technicians, even medical receptionists and other office staff. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to let you know that this is exactly why we have hearings, to let you know that we take this feedback seriously and your recommendations to heart, 
and that the resolution in its language right now is, is not final and is open to amendment. And so I want to thank you for making those suggestions very, very much. And thank you for all, all of you for sharing your personal experience. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your time and I really appreciate this resolution. Uh, as you see, this is very personal for all of us um, for implicit bias training. I'm going to read the testimony of Dr. Carla Booten Foster, who is the Associate Dean, Office of Diversity, Education and Research at SUNY Downstate Health Center. She um, works very closely with us and she's very interested in um, changing curriculum for physicians to include implicit bias. Um, thank you for your commitment to promoting health equity. I write to you as the daughter of a Haitian American man, though by training I'm a physician and a researcher. About 10 years ago, my then 70-year-old father developed painless hematuria, blood in the urine. As a physician and a researcher, I immediately knew the diagnosis. As a daughter, I was terrified. My father did not like going to the doctor because he he feared hearing bad news. I found it ironic my father's fear of hearing bad news turned out to be real when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. But this <clears throat> only reinforces the importance of regular doctor visits. As a physician, I knew I needed to find a doctor who would offer my dad the latest clinical therapies, one who would also be able to put him at ease while communicating with him. We were fortunate enough to find someone whose bedside manner immediately put my dad at ease because he understood my father's fears. I was blessed that we found a physician who was interested in the fact that he was Haitian, one who knew that he lived in Brooklyn, who spoke to him about the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge because he knew that my father was an engineer and a math teacher. I was glad to have found a physician who knew that my father enjoyed walking across the Brooklyn Bridge, but was now limited because of his severe osteoarthritis. I was grateful for the physician who recognized my father's tremendous anxiety and would utter a few words in Creole just to bring a little levity to an often heavy discussion. Of note, this physician was not Haitian. While my dad's experience was positive, sadly it was not the same for everyone. I can recall a story of a health advocate who went to get a mammogram and was told, you people, people in a wheelchair, cannot be treated here. I also recall a family friend who said when he went to the doctor was referred to as you people. These types of responses make it all the more difficult for people to want to see doctors. There is so much work to be done. Several medical schools have integrated elements into their curriculum that introduce students to health disparities, health inequities, social determinants, cultural competencies, and unconscious bias. As our population becomes increasingly diverse, there's an eater, even greater urge for integrating these dimensions of professionalism into the medical school curriculum. Future physicians must be able to attend understand how effectively communicate with patients in a way that reaffirms their values. Physicians must be able to recognize and respond to their own unconscious biases, and future physicians must appreciate how cultural influences healthcare and outcomes. There is a need to move beyond safe discussions about cultural competence and disparities and create safe spaces where these students openly discuss racism, bias, and discrimination, and more importantly, how these concerns affect the inadequate quality of healthcare that is often associated with traditionally underserved communities. <clears throat> I am hopeful that these discussions will move academic health centers, community organizations, and city council leaders to work collaboratively towards developing a more diverse and culturally competent workforce. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for assisting us today. I just wanted to make sure, did we hear from Sharifa? I'm sorry, Sharifa last minute could not make it. That's okay, oh. we, we will submit her testimony for the record though. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for, for reading that uh, coming from someone, um, people who have experience in the field who also are facing receiving care and, and for all of your advocacy. We, we, again, we're open to recommendations on how we can make this the strongest resolution possible because we have every intention of continuing this conversation and lobbying our colleagues in Albany who have a lot of say over what we can do to improve 
just our health system overall, public or private. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. I'm gonna call up uh, Sasha Panapa. Dr. Tara Cortez. Christina Gonzalez. I have three uh, the students, uh, Connor Fox, Rachel Willingson, and Alec Feverbach. I also have Andrea Bowen here. I wanna make sure we could fit you all. I'm sorry if I just called up the whole room. Um, So for uh, all of you that are standing, they're getting your chairs right now. And I appreciate kind of, I know some people have to go and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. How are we doing? One more, one more chair. Okay, yeah. Who would like to, do you want to start? Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Christina Gonzalez. I'm a physician and a scientist. And uh, my singular focus of research is on designing, implementing, and evaluating interventions on implicit bias recognition and management. I have uh, prepared a short written testimony um, with a lot of references. And of course, I have a lot to say based on the excellent uh, uh, testimony and, and, and advocacy from the previous people. Did you want me just to stick to this or? Honestly, it's up to you. It, within just a couple minutes, you can, you can read, you can hit a couple of important points if you'd like, or cover things that maybe you don't felt were underlined. It's, it's really up to you. Just know this will be submitted for the record and anything else that you say. Oh, perfect, now I'll say other things. Okay. And, <laughs> and so, uh, briefly, uh, I want to applaud your work on uh, writing this resolution and addressing the problem of implicit bias, and I think that there are opportunities for implicit bias education or training in ac across the spectrum of training and practice, and I want to emphasize the um, pers the importance of what our uh, colleagues said in the previous testimony regarding uh, the training all the way through from front desk all the way to whoever checks you out and parking attendants, you name it. We've built the model and published it actually on patient perspectives, my team and I, on um, how they perceive bias. And so uh, sometimes, I, I, I'll speak for myself, I as a physician may make an assumption and, and say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, but I also may be asking standard questions that we teach our medical students to ask, but based on their lived experience of um, perhaps being covertly accused of things, so I, if I'm asking if they smoke, because it, I was taught to ask if they smoke for risk factors, they may be you know, put off by that. And, and, and training um, students and, and, and beyond to real, realize the perspective taking importance and to the lived experience of the patient and to work on not taking it personally. Patients have talked about being snubbed at the front desk. 
and then seeing the physician. And so they may be in a different place mentally than, than where I would assume they were based on, on perhaps my intentions. And so uh, looking at uh, b beyond the, the health conditions in the, in the resolution, which I imagine wasn't meant to be all encompassing, but things as simple as verbal dominance and non-verbal uh, non behaviors such as interpersonal distance and safe touch are, have been directly related to implicit bias tested in uh, physicians. And in addition to decision making related to life saving procedures, medications, uh, going to the cath lab during a heart attack. And so there are many existing programs. I have developed electives and thank you for saying not to just leave them as electives because once the science is worked out, because you do need to have new science, sometimes in a friendly audience uh, as a medical education researcher, you need to pilot it, do the innovation, make sure it works, and roll it out to the broad audience, as you will never change policy on the outcomes of the self-selected uh, volunteers, right, who are wonderful for electives. And um, so we have done extensive work on patient, student, and faculty perspectives, and I just want to say that if there's a way in the resolution, just as a way to try to contribute to, to the, the knowledge base, to move beyond one training because there are unintended consequences of raising awareness. Right? So if you raise awareness and you stop, which is often what you can do in one session, raising awareness of your own implicit bias, there are data to support that there are subsequent um, negative effects such as social avoidance, Right, because good people with good intentions who realize they may be biased against groups they don't want to consciously be biased against, without skill development, may actually withdraw and then and, and avoid encounters, maybe shorten visits even with, with patients. And so le getting to actual skill development and the outcomes you mentioned tracking, if we can push the field and each other to move beyond um, how many people took the course or took a session to actual patients oriented outcomes, right? Including communication, including decision making, which can be measured and tracked. And um, we have NIH funding right now to, to work on validating outcome metrics because people will, are, no matter how good their intentions are, are unlikely to engage in multiple sessions if they don't have any evidence that they're effective, right? And that they don't have any outcomes to strive for. And so um, I'm available to, if, for any discussion, if ever you think it might be helpful. Uh, this is a singular professional passion, um, and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Rivera and Council Members present. My name is Dr. Tara Cortez, and I'm the Executive Director and a Professor at the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing, which is the geriatric arm of New York University, Rory Myers College of Nursing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and share my expertise in the topic of healthcare service delivery and outcomes among urban populations. Access to affordable, quality, and timely healthcare contributes to efficient and effective healthcare. Improved access to good primary care can contribute to the prevention of chronic diseases, better management of existing chronic diseases, and earlier detection of health issues. But there are several reasons that are barriers to accessible health care. And the first one that is usually thought of is people who do not have access to health insurance. And this affects all, all people, including those who are, are marginalized populations, such as those who, with, with that, who are part of the racism, those who are disabled, and those in the LGBTQ community. 27.5 million people in the United States, or 8.5% of the population, went without health insurance in 2018. The number is slowly rising. That's an increase of 1.9 million people from the previous year. Others do not have access to health services because of language barriers, insensitive to cult insensitivity to cultural differences, or immigration status. We saw a very interesting and fascinating picture. It's, it's tough to follow the first panel because they were so compelling. These people most often receive their primary care in the city's emergency rooms where they go when they have a health issue. This inappropriate use of the health care system is not only costly, but also does not provide people with the care needed to decrease the incidence of or mitigate the impact of chronic disease. It results in poorer health outcomes, lower quality of life, and a higher mortality rate. 
The Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing has developed two online e-learning e modules for the Arch Care uh, Workforce Improvement Organization to address cultural diversity and competency in healthcare. The one is to address interprofessionals, and the second one was, uh, was specifically designed for health, home health aides and CNAs. However, access to quality clinical care is not the only determinant of better health outcomes. The county health rankings developed by the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation look at multiple factors that contribute to the health and health equity of a community. Those factors, known as determinants of health, have shown that clinical care, including access to and quality of that care, only contributes 20% to length of life and quality of life in a community. Social economic factors, which are characterized by where people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and defined by education, employment, and income, contribute 40%. Health behaviors defined by activity, nutrition, smoking, and sexual health contribute 30%. And physical environment, air quality, uh, water quality, and housing contributes 10%. In New York in 2019, the Bronx is ranked number 62 in health outcomes. That is the lowest in the entire state. New York County is number five, Queens is number eight, Kings is number 17, and Richmond is number 28. Health behaviors are, account for 30% of the influence on our health outcomes and actions people take to affect their health. So this is something that could be intervened. There could be an intervention for health behaviors that's maybe low-hanging fruit. It includes actions such as eating well, being physically active, and avoiding actions which increase the risk of disease, such as smoking, excessive alcohol intake, and risky sexual behavior. For example, poor nutrition and lack of exercise are associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. Tobacco use is associated with cardiovascular disease, cancer, and poor pregnancy outcomes. Excessive alcohol intake is associated with injuries, certain cancers, and liver disease, as well as poor pregnancy outcomes. So health behaviors certainly also affect maternal and children outcomes of, of maternity health. The Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing believes that to achieve good health outcomes, we need to break down the doors, the four walls of the hospital system and extend care across the continuum to include community resources and recognize those as a partner in healthcare. Those communities are the culturally sensitive resources for people who live in them. The Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing has implemented an initiative in the Bronx in partnership with two community-based organizations, Rain and JASA, to increase health literacy and impact health outcomes for older adults in the Bronx. Using community-based volunteers, peer-to-peer -peer education to ensure cultural competency, we have educated almost 200 volunteers who have held nearly 300 classes and educated nearly 5,000 older adults on such topics as exercise, nutrition, stress management, sexuality, oral health, opioid uses, misuse, and management of chronic diseases, asthma, heart disease, and dementia. When surveyed between one and three months after completing this education, 79% of the seniors say they've changed their behaviors, and 75% said they, they feel their health has improved. One participant said, oh my gosh, you saved my life. And when we asked her why, she said, I never knew how to talk to my doctor. And from the class, I learned how to talk to my doctor, and I was on the wrong asthma medication. He has changed my medication, and now I feel so much better. In summary, improving population health requires more than just addressing health care access and cost. Risk behaviors such as poor food choices or sedentary lifestyles and social economic physical conditions such as food insecurity and housing, whose combined impact on health outcomes exceeds that of clinical care by four to one, also needs to be addressed. I would recommend that those be included in the resolution. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We welcome any additional questions the committee may have. Uh, I just have a question because I'm I'm wondering here. You said risk behaviors. You said something should be included in the language for the resolution. Yeah, Can I, you? I mean the other determinants of, um, of of health, meaning socioeconomic, the uh, health behaviors, as well as physical environment. That should be included in the resolution to improve implicit bias training in some of our medical training institutions? Yes, because those are, health, health behaviors are very often culturally driven. You can just talk into the mic. Yeah, Understood, I, but I, you, do, I, you don't, do you I, not think that curriculum is, is covered into, in especially if, let's say we have New York students, mm -hmm. and this is a very, very diverse city, and I mentioned some statistics and some demographics and how people are suffering in, from certain epidemics more than others, and so, I, you want that language of social determinants of health to be included in the curriculum in some of our schools? Is it not included? It's beginning to be trickling in, but it's not universally included. I, I, not every curriculum is including a comprehensive social determinants of health, particularly looking at how do we change those aspects of health care. We still focus primarily in, in nursing education and I think still in medical education. We focus primarily on clinical care. And as important as it is, and as important as that is uh, to a particular discipline, it takes the whole healthcare team. It's an interprofessional team. So I th we still don't have interprofessional education embedded into our systems. We still teach in silos. Until we can really embed interprofessional education and cross over so that who does take care of, of uh, some of the social determinants of health? It's social workers, it's occupational therapists who address things in the environment. So it needs to be an interprofessional approach, and I think that we need to be more clear on that in the resolution, that it's more than just access to clinical care, but it's access to care that incorporates these concepts. But do you agree that medical schools should be training students more competently in implicit bias, yes or no? Yes. I do, but I also think our workforce, because I think what happens to a lot of students, they get into a workforce that doesn't, doesn't practice what, they, what is now being taught because many of them grew up in an age when this was not part of a curriculum. They enter that workforce which is not focused on that. So unless we educate the workforce about these things so that people coming out of schools with this knowledge are in a workforce that understand what they're talking about and embrace it and encompass it into their practice, we won't make the change. Okay, I'm sure I'll have some follow-up questions to that and I have your contact information and the testimony, thank you. Uh, esteemed members of the New York City Council, thank you for having us. My name is Connor Fox and I'm joined today by Rachel Wilkinson and Alex Borbach. We're students at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. We appreciate the opportunity to offer testimony on Resolution 512 as to how mandatory implicit bias training will benefit students in New York State Medical Schools, as well as the patients we serve. As students at an institution that has already implemented an implicit bias curriculum over the past several years, we'd like to offer our perspectives on the tremendous value of this type of education, in addition to discussing ways in which medical schools and hospitals could do even more to address racism and bias in healthcare. Uh, our school is sought to be a leader in vocally and intentionally addressing racism and bias in our medical school curriculum. In 2018, our school launched a racism and bias initiative with the goal of eradicating racism and bias completely from the environment and education at Mount Sinai. Part of the initiative is expanding the two-year longitudinal curriculum uh, on racism and bias that students have during their preclinical years. I use the word preclinical to describe medical <coughs> education that takes place in the classroom typically in the first two years of medical school, before medical students begin clinical education rotating through various hospital and clinic settings. I make this distinction between preclinical and clinical education in order to highlight, highlight the stark contrast between what we learn in our preclinical racism and bias curriculum versus what we learn hands-on during clinical training. As a fourth year student at Sinai, I was in one of the first classes of students to complete the preclinical racism and bias curriculum which was developed with the help of students just a few years ahead of me. The curriculum, which takes uh, place in a series of classes throughout the first two years, 
covers instances of historical racism like the Tuskegee experiments, unpacks the inherent racism in current clinical guidelines that categorize patients on the basis of race, and challenges students to confront their own implicit biases. This curriculum has helped prepare me to be an effective and compassionate provider to medically underserved or marginalized patients, and has equipped me to make serious efforts to reduce inequities present in today's healthcare landscape. Such curricula are hugely helpful in empowering the next generation of physicians to address social injustices in medicine, and should indeed be required at all New York State medical schools. However, a preclinical implicit bias curriculum alone is not sufficient. Even if all medical students are trained to be aware of their implicit biases, little will change if these same students learn to practice medicine in institutions and systems that are not designed to treat patients equally. This is an issue faced by medical schools in New York City and across the United States. So what students learn from clinical training in a biased system is often referred to as the hidden curriculum of medical school. This curriculum teaches medical students that the lives of some patients are more valuable than others, and that those others, who are typically people of color, patients who don't speak English, patients with undocumented immigration status, or other marginalized patients, are to be valued primarily as training for the training opportunities that they provide. One major driver of this hidden curriculum during medical school is the fact that in many healthcare settings, patients are routinely separated on the basis of their socioeconomic status. For example, in New York State, and especially here in New York City, many hospital systems commonly separate patients insured with Medicaid from patients with private insurance or Medicare, a practice that we're referring to as segregated care. This segregation can take a variety of forms. Patients can be seen in separate sites, they can be seen in the same site but at different times, and they can be seen at the same time but by different providers. Most commonly, patients with Medicaid or patients that are uninsured are seen by a rotating cast of residents in one clinic, while privately and Medicare-insured patients are seen by dedicating attending, dedicated attending physicians in another. Much of clinical training for medical students and residents occurs in the context of providing care to patients who are not privately insured and who are being seen in those resident clinics. This practice of separating patients based on insurance yields de facto racial segregation, because here in New York State, people of color are twice as likely to be insured by Medicare compared to white patients. This separation within the health system is one of the key reasons that non-white patients have less access to care and continuity in their care compared to white patients. So rather than undoing or dismantling the socioeconomic factors that disadvantage the health of these patients, our hospital systems reiterate and reinforce them in the very structure by which we deliver care and in how we train the next generation of physicians. And unfortunately, there's also very little anti-racism and bias training provided during the clinical phase of training to equip students to address these systemic inequities. In light of this, students at Mount Sinai have advocated for changes to this system for the past several years. In 2018, we began surveying clinical year students on how this segregated system impacts their education. The results from the fall of 2018 showed that 40% of respondents witnessed one or more incidents of segregated care within their first three months of clinical rotations. A 2019 end of year survey of all students at the school showed that 58% of respondents believed segregated care negatively affected their education, and 80% of respondents believed these differences in care may lead to worse health outcomes. Now, these experiences ranged from seeing patients with private insurance admitted to more comfortable inpatient units to a lack of adequate attending supervision when working with patients covered by Medicaid, to being allowed to participate only in births with women that were covered by Medicaid and seen in the resident clinic. From our survey, we have compiled a few of the quotes that illustrate the pervasiveness of these differences in care and how they damage uh, patients and trainees. As one student wrote, it truly feels like every single aspect of patient care from the way physicians and ancillary staff speak about patients, speak to patients, formulate treatment plans for patients, and teach medical students to treat patients is different based on patient insurance status. 
Another student wrote, this system is perpetuating biases in our generation of doctors by training them in an environment that inherently prejudices you against poor people of color. A third student wrote, I repeatedly heard residents comment about how much more relaxed they felt treating poor or Medicaid patients, how if mistakes happened, it didn't matter as much. A fourth student, this system affects every aspect of patient care, so therefore also affects every aspect of learning. It was so blatant, so ingrained into resident and attending culture, and so entrenched in the language used on the wards that no one even seemed to realize how messed up it was. A fifth student, because we do so much observing and imitating third year, we have a heightened ability to notice it, but also to subconsciously internalize and mimic certain aspects of these behaviors. And a sixth student, it makes me feel sort of disappointed to be a doctor, but also feel sort of powerless to do anything about it. Further student accounts can be found in our addendum. Though these accounts were collected at Mount Sinai, our correspondences with students at other medical schools suggest that these comments reflect experiences of students at medical schools across the city. They underscore that the way that students are educated in New York's medical schools and the way the patients are treated in New York's hospitals are inextricably linked. Training in a bias system will inevitably engender bias among trainees. While implicit bias training across all stages of training and at all medical schools in New York State will equip medical students with tools to consider and address their own biases, such measures will not be as impactful if they are directly contradicted by what medical students are taught during their clinical education. We as students are therefore in support of a mandate that all New York State medical students receive implicit bias training. But we implore our legislators to take further action to address the structural racism and bias inherent in how New York State delivers healthcare. While healthcare systems may ultimately determine clinic staffing and student rotations, city and state policies may, um, can play a significant role in determining what types of patients are seen where. For example, healthcare systems in New York State are often limited in providing care to publicly insured patients only in hospital spaces that qualify for maximum Medicaid reimbursement thereby setting the conditions for patients to be seen in separate clinics solely based on their insurance status. By addressing these and other barriers, we can start to construct a healthcare system free of systemic racism and bias, and only in such a system can we train medical students to treat patients equitably and without prejudice. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for bringing up insurance-based discrimination. It, it's, it's kind of astounding I feel like how little we talk about it or th that it should be brought up more often. How has the school responded to, to, these, uh, to this report, to, to this, this data collection? And, and do you have counterparts in other medical schools that are really trying to compile this type of information? Uh, I guess regarding the second question first, we have been in contact with other students at other schools and have communicated with, with them and have heard anecdotally that they experience similar sorts of things, but I don't think that anywhere else they have taken these exact same efforts. Um, in terms of how the school has responded, they have started a sort of health equity task force that is trying to address these matters. Um, some of the issues have, that we have encountered in trying to push for integration of clinical spaces has, as far as we as students under th understand things, been, um, I guess, a barrier towards integration has been physical space and the fact that the hospital is trying to get maximum uh, Medicaid reimbursement by seeing Medicaid patients in hospital spaces as defined by Article 28. Um, and they are then seeing uh, the non-Medicaid insured patients in spaces that do not meet Article 28 requirements for full reimbursement. So uh, even though the state law is sort of enabling segregation, even if it's not uh, explicitly doing saying anything about it. They put together a health equity task force kind of based on these. Oh, I, I'm gonna follow up with them. I, it, I'd be interested to know their format and kind of their their goals. And I guess I have you all to thank for it. I think it's incredibly important. And, and, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, 
this year up, Andy. Thank you, Chair Rivera, for um, uh, the opportunity to provide testimony today. Um, thank you for your consistent, amazing work uh, in um, supporting um, uh, marginalized communities and public hospitals. And uh, I want to give a shout out to Councilmember Rosenthal for um, res number, uh, resolution number um, 512. Um, so my name is Andrea Bowen. I'm Principal of Bowen Public Affairs Consulting. I'm speaking on my own behalf today, even though I generally work with several organizations that work with um, uh, transgender, nonconforming, and non-binary people. I'm just speaking off uh, <laughs> the testimony today. Um, so um, first of all, I want to thank, start by thanking you um, and your many colleagues, but you really led the charge on getting uh, funding for the LGBTQ health outreach workers at H&H. &H. Um, it's really exciting to see those implemented. Um, and um, I guess I just wanted to emphasize a couple of things moving on forward from that baseline funding, which was um, just, again, making sure that there's as much advertising as possible that they exist. Um, and uh, that they can like really spread the word that TGNC MB folks can get quality care in the H and H system. Um, and as word spreads about these positions, that their numbers expand commensurate with need. Um, uh, I think the H and H is still keeping it at about three uh, folks who are doing the um, this work with the L or the uh, LGBTQ community outreach workers. Um, but the baseline funding, I would imagine, would make it more possible for expansion moving forward. Um, when it comes to, I guess, um, uh, issues directly related to the oversight function of this hearing, um, I just, I don't know if this is possible, but if some of the testimonies that were um, provided by TGNC MB community members over the last year could be maybe put on the record for this one, I don't know if that's doable, but I'd love to make the ask. I mentioned the hearings where they take place, so if it's it, submitted, we could. Okay, cool. Um, I don't. Ha I, I mean, I only have my own, but there were like a lot of people who testified in those, so, um, so hopefully that was all coherent. Um, as regards uh, promotion of implicit bias training, um, so um, I'm totally in favor of that, so long as it's high quality and effective. Um, and by that, I mean. Um, it should involve, a, implicit bias trainings obviously should involve a community input process, use an experienced curriculum developer and trainer, include a pilot study, a series of refinements, this all on page two. Sorry, I'm kind of jumping around. Um, just to make sure that like there's a clear theory of change, that the theory of change is evidence-based, um, and that um, the actions taken by the trainer affect the attitudes and behavior of the trainees towards marginalized communities in question. Um, uh, and of course, like th th this kind of um, training, from my understanding, works best when it's um, put together by someone who has, you know, a stature in the field that they're training. So. Um, we would want this to be like a trustworthy authority in the field of clinical practice, as well as like the field of competencies pertinent to the marginalized communities that the trainings are focusing on. Um, am I coherent so far? Yes. Okay. And I, cool. And you're you're providing us with a redlined version, which is always helpful. Okay. Not too much. No, no. <laughs> um, uh, as an example of um, like a, a really, this is not implicit bias, but it's something that was done by the city that. Um, I think was a really cool model, um, uh, and I think was actually effective. Um, uh, so DOHMH did um, a TGNCMB training curriculum for the sexual health clinics, um, and so they used adult learning theory and allowed clinicians to practice anti-bias techniques that they learned by working with paid practice patients from the TGNCMB community. Um, I think speaking to the direct skill, um, skill development work that my colleague mentioned earlier, um, so the practice patients were there to make sure the clinicians could actually like practice using the right pronouns and practice using affirming practices. Um, and it's a model that really should be incorporated more widely. Um, and I put that language also in the redlined version. So implicit bias is important to root out, but we also want to make sure that like focusing on the skills aspect so that they can practice affirming skills um, is also followed through on. So um, added that to the reso language and. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Sorry. All right.
Hello, good morning, and good afternoon. My name is Sasha Panapa. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my role is a little bit different than everyone here. Um, I'm actually here as a person who experienced discrimination and bias at one of the local hospitals here. Um, nine months ago, I was hit by a car, and while I was walking across the street, an SUV ran the red light and hit me and I flew about 40 to 50 feet, and I was brought to the hospital. I was at the hospital for 12 hours, and while then nobody provided me sign language interpreting services. I shattered my wrist, I had a concussion, and I injured both my knees, and I had no language access to my medical care, what was wrong, the severity of my injuries for 12 hours. And I think, while I was there, maybe about five or six times, I asked for a patient advocate. Because my background is providing medical training to hospitals on disability services in another state. And so in this hospital, I asked five times for a patient advocate. Nobody called me, nobody came, nobody got me, and nobody gave me an interpreter. My sister ended up becoming my interpreter at the hospital, and that was not her role. And her role was supposed to take care of me and make sure that I survived. And the nurse at the hospital in one of the patient waiting rooms asked her to leave. My sister was explaining to her, she's deaf, she cannot hear, she can't sign, she shattered her dominant hand. And the nurse threatened to call the police. My sister left the room. The same nurse, five minutes later, was on her computer ordering a $900 video game console. So that is bias. That you couldn't value your patient's language assets to their trauma, to their accident, to whatever they're experiencing. Deaf people are people. We are surviving crimes, we are delivering babies, we have cancer, we are taking care of sick children and families. We are people. And that bias is not acceptable. So as I'm listening to everyone talking about their biases and their trainings and their curriculum, I think that's great. But one of the biggest components of that training and that curriculum needs to be how do you execute that? Who do you contact at your hospital? Who is the patient advocate? What are the resources at the hospital? Did that nurse know? Did the frontline staff know? Did my doctors know? Did anybody in the hospital in that 12 hours know who to call? How to respond to me? Where are the resources? Who is the patient advocate? And this is a city hospital. And they're trying to do tremendous amount of work for people of color, people of low income, people who are disabled, all, every, everybody that we're talking about. And they're doing amazing work, but it's not amazing if we can't access it. So I'm here to say that this is my story and I hope that going forward when they do hopefully pass this, that a part of that curriculum and that bias includes the actual implementation of what are you gonna do when somebody's there? And you have a patient in front of you and I'm not quite sure how to support them. I'm not quite sure how to address their needs because of my bias or the lack of information from where I work. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I, I, your story is, is important, well, that you felt that comfortable enough to share it with us, but also because you're clearly someone, I would say, who's informed as to their rights. You asked five times, correct? Yes. For assistance, and you did not receive it. It's so, yeah. so for those who don't know how to ask for help, and for when someone finally gets the message and they can't support you in the way that you need, who do they call?
These are all concerns that we're trying to raise today. And I, I want to make sure that as we have this conversation, why your story in particular is so important is because you are an advocate and you know how to navigate the system from what it sounds like based on your professional experience. And I want to make sure that we're not putting 100% of the onus on patients. So thank you. Thank you so much. Can I add something? Absolutely. In New York City alone, there's 250,000 deaf and hard of hearing people. So it would be nice to know across all of the medical schools, all of the hospitals here, what are their resources? How are they tracking their best effort and their best practice to meet the needs of all of these deaf people that are accessing their medical services? Correct. And and. We, we plan to um, continue asking H&H &H and every hospital, quite frankly, and health clinic citywide, how they plan to, to implement what I think is a better plan. Because I, I always say a, a disability or however you characterize your limitation, that's a minority group that anyone can join. So thank you. Thank you. Heidi Siegfried, Juan Pinto, Eric Gale, and Christopher Schuyler. Oh, and, and also Kate Stein. Yes, sir. Kate, sorry. Hi, Kate. I, do, I don't have a light. Oh, now it's red. That's good, though, right? <laughs> red is good. <laughs> I was like, a green. Okay, so um, I'm Heidi Siegfried. I'm the Health Policy Director at Center for Independence of the Disabled in New York, which is a nonprofit organization with the goal of ensuring full integration, independence, and equal opportunity for all people with disabilities by removing barriers to full participation in the community. And we help people, um, we have a lot of programs, but we help people understand and roll in and use their private and public health uh, coverage and also to access the care they need. So we definitely endorse resolution uh, 512 calling on New York State to require medical schools to train all students about implicit bias. And we would urge that it would include an exploration of attitudes towards people with all types of disabilities. So that would include mobility impairments, but also visual, hearing, ambulatory, cognitive, self-care, independent living. These are all the um, American Community Survey uh, ways of characterizing disability and, and, and identifying it and counting it. Um, so anyway, people with disabilities do report being treated unfairly, and I think we heard I've heard some of that today, um, and they report negative attitudes and lack of knowledge about treating people with disabilities. Physicians receive training on disability issues. Um, it, it's really, it, it doesn't happen that often, and the lack of knowledge or disability-related education is consistent with other reports finding inadequate preparedness to provide health services to people with disabilities. Um, a complex interaction of factors influences health status and health outcomes for people with disabilities, and these include the limited enforcement of non-discrimination, accessibility, accommodation, policy modification, and the communications that are required by the ADA, and the lack of um, provider education and training, the lack of disability literacy, uh, stigma, and stereotypes. Um, to learn more about consumer experiences with health plan networks, we um, conducted a series of focus groups with um, the Public Policy Education Fund, Raising Women's Voices for the Healthcare We Need, New York Immigration Coalition, and Met 
Metro New York Healthcare for All in 2017 and 2018. And um, we had, you know, a wide range of people in our focus groups in, in terms of race, ethnicity, disability, immigration status. Um, we conducted um, specialized sessions with Spanish speakers, women, and LGBTQ people. And we asked people, we were, of course, looking at network adequacy. So we were looking at appointment availability and office locations and hours and but we did ask people about non-clinical um, competency and, and what their experience was in, of care. And low-income people and people of color did express concerns with practitioners that had insufficient sensitivity to their life situations and the issues that they faced. One participant that we profiled um, for our report uh, said that some practitioners do not take the complaints of pain by black women like herself seriously enough. And she said that at least one practitioner made a real difference for her economically because this practitioner, unlike others, recommended lower cost alternatives to the drugs they had prescribed. Participants in the LGBTQ listening session spoke about the difficulty they experienced finding providers who are sensitive and understanding of their health needs as LGBTQ individuals. A number of participants have had experiences where they believe their provider was not respectful of their gender identity or expression or sexual orientation. And we included one story in our report that um, you know, a, a, a physician who was unfamiliar with, with PrEP and, and, you know, and then having to talk about it and explain, you know, what it is and why you, you know, and what your sexual orientation is was just, I mean, it was really a horrible experience to, to learn about. And now PrEP is a U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, um, uh, you know, A and B recommendation that you don't even have to have a copay for, <laughs> and this doctor didn't even know about it. So, um, yeah, and then of course people with disabilities report um, inaccessible providers and all that. So our recommendation in our report was that New York should establish, see, we don't feel that we have the expertise to really, you know, say exactly what should happen, but that there, there should be a work group that includes all the relevant stakeholders with the responsibility of recommending cultural competency standards for provider networks. Um, and certainly, you know, consumers have better health outcomes when providers are culturally competent. Um, and we think of cultural competence in the, in the broadest sense involving an understanding of and respect for a person's culture and orientation, age, disability, and socioeconomic status. So there's a lot of trainings and courses and certifications, and um, we thought a, a stakeholder work group should be created with the responsibility of, of, of recommending standards, including trainings, to ensure that all providers are, are culturally competent. Uh, certainly a requirement that medical schools train all students about implicit bias would go a long way to helping providers deliver culturally competent care. At Sydney, we also see this as part of a civil rights framework. So um, Section 1557, which has not been repealed and cannot be repealed as long as we have a Democratic House, um, of the Affordable Care Act prohibits discrimination in health care programs on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, sex stereotypes, gender identity, age, or disability. Um, and providers who are not aware of their implicit bias may actually wind up discriminating in the delivery of care in violation of this statute, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and other civil rights laws. So the ADA in particular is a little different from most civil rights laws in that it, you know, most civil rights laws require equal treatment, but with the, with the Americans with Disabilities Act, it requires accommodation, so you have to sort of like vary your policies and practices um, to ensure that a person with a disability can benefit from the health program or services to the same extent as a non-disabled person. So implies, implicit bias training would really help providers to, to understand and fulfill their responsibility to accommodate uh, people with disabilities. So we really appreciate this, um, this resolution and wholeheartedly endorse it, and we thank you for the consideration of our comments. Thank you.
esteemed members of the City Council, my name is Eric Gale. I am a family physician and senior medical director for the Institute for Family Health. I am speaking to you on behalf of the Institute for Family Health, a network of 35 federally qualified health centers that was founded by Dr. Neil Kalman, who still serves as its president and CEO. Dr. Kalman is in Washington, D.C. today seeking continued funding for our programs with no federal budget yet passed for the coming year, which, it's, which starts in just two weeks. Thank you for inviting me to testify on Resolution 512, which would require the training of all medical students in implicit bias. I strongly support this resolution, but as you will see, I believe it must be coupled with other requirements for it to achieve its desired goal. That goal being to assure that all people receive the full range of compassionate, high quality services that they need and that all people who come to hospitals in New York City are provided that care on an equal basis, regardless of race, ethnicity, language, gender, or source of payment. Last year, the Institute for Family Health served over 116,000 patients in over 650,000 visits. Primary care, oral health, behavioral health. Of the patients we serve, over 50% identify as black or Hispanic Latino, and over 18% are best served in a language other than English. Only 30% of our patients have private insurance. We also provide services to populations requiring specialized medical services, such as through the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Around 4,000 4, students were served at our school-based health centers, and 1,000 patients were served at our satellite sites in homeless centers. This is all to say we serve a diverse group of patients from all walks of life. In addition to the care we provide to patients, we are deeply committed to training and educating the next generation of clinicians. We run two family medicine residency programs in New York City and one in the Mid-Hudson region, graduating about 23 residents each year. Our fellowships include those in nurse practitioners, addiction medicine, integrated family medicine, women's health, and clinical research. Our institute trains medical students as well, mostly from Mount Sinai, but also at least 200 students from NYU and Einstein in our free clinics in the Bronx and Manhattan. Implicit bias training is necessary, but is not enough, but it's not sufficient. All of us have grown up with biases that have the potential of influencing our clinical decisions and for clinicians, these biases are potentially harmful to their patients. Implicit bias training for medical students is the first step in addressing personalized and internalized forms of racism and other biases in healthcare. There is much evidence in medicine supporting this. In a 12-week longitudinal study, participants of a multifaceted prejudice habit-breaking intervention experienced reductions in implicit race-based race bias and increased concern about discrimination and personal awareness of bias. Another study measured implicit bias against African Americans in medical students in their first year, then again in their fourth year, and showed that participating in a formal curriculum significantly decreased implicit bias. The study suggests that just the act of taking a black-white implicit association test predicted a decrease in implicit bias. Implementing an implicit bias curriculum and debriefing session in preclinical years changed outcomes in implicit bias associated tests. In, ad in addition to these promising outcomes, implicit bias training with clinicians has the ability to improve patient satisfaction and experience. Research is developing to measure training impact on clinical outcomes. In our own program, a New York State-sponsored fellow in our Empire State Research Program, Dr. Yvonne McLean, is implementing a longitudinal training program for family medicine residents to measure persistent bias, the impact of a longitudinal curriculum, and ways to measure patient clinical outcomes. Suggestions to improve the re Resolution 512. Let me now make some suggestions for improving Resolution 512. First, it currently only applies to medical students. Implicit bias training should include the entire clinical team and training people in interdisciplinary teams has many other advantages. Second, before training students, the faculty must be trained. 
attitudes are formed and reinforced by cultural factors. In one study, hearing negative comments from attending physicians or residents about African American patients was a statistically significant predictor of increased implicit bias. In addition, we need to encourage ongoing trainings with continued discussion in addition to the proposed initial training. An advisory group should be established to determine what the minimum training requirements should be. I don't believe a one hour lecture in a classroom setting or an online training will have the desired impact. More important than anything I have said so far is that Resolution 512 does not even touch the main issue in, in the delivery of racially and ethnically biased care, and that is structural racism in the manner in which medical care is paid for and in, way, in the way our hospital system is structured in New York City. Teaching about implicit bias in an environment that does not treat all patients equally negates any possible beneficial impact of implicit bias training. It says, do what I say and not what I do. There are many components of, to the systematic race, structural racism in our healthcare system in New York City. It starts with a state that pays, for, pays far less for care under Medicaid, where underrepresented minorities are 66% of the population compared to Medicare, where the population is only 32% minority. We have created a reimbursement system that values health care for the elderly more than it values health care for the poor in a reality where those who, are, who reach age 65 to collect Medicare are disproportionately white. Second, people covered by Medicaid or Medicaid managed care and, has the uninsured or, uh, and the uninsured are relegated to clinics within our, our academic medical centers and are rarely accepted into the faculty practices which are run by their affiliated medical schools. Because these clinics are intentionally under-resourced by the institutions who sponsor them, what results are long, sometimes infinitely long waits for care by specialists. In fact, many of these patients end up in the public hospital system, which is then adversely affected economically by serving patients who are uninsured or insured mostly by Medicaid. Do As Dr. Gale, if you could just wrap up. Everything is going to be submitted for the record, and I want to thank you for your recommendations because you also brought up insurance-based discrimination, which I think is incredibly important, and hopefully we'll discuss single-payer soon, but anyway. Um, so if you could just wrap up your comments to make sure that we can uh, get sure. to you. Thank you so much. Um, so I will end by saying that this is all remediable, and there are laws and regulations in place already that should be able to limit these practices, but which are not enforced. One example is the New York State Hospital Patient Bill of Rights, which states that patients have a right to receive treatment without discrimination as a source of payment. Here in New York City, the public accommodations law defines hospitals and medical offices as places of public accommodation among other facilities, but needs to cite differential access by source of payment or insurance as a form of discrimination. By accurately identifying the faculty practices of academic medical centers accurately as functions of the hospital itself, even Title VI of the Civil Rights Act can be used to help correct inequities in place of treatment. In conclusion, we support the mandatory implicit bias training of medical students, but these must be coupled with structural reforms to correct the racism and discrimination by source of payment that has long plagued our healthcare system while I applaud the New York City Council for this resolution and their commitment to address, addressing health disparities, I also implore you to look further into the structures and system that institutionalize racism in healthcare here in New York City. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Kate Steinley, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Clinical Services and the Director of the Transgender Health Services at Planned Parenthood of New York City. Thank you to Chair Rivera, as well as the committee con for convening this hearing. Planned Parenthood of New York City acknowledges the importance of cultural competency within healthcare, and I'm pleased to submit testimony in support of Resolution 512. For over 100 years, Planned Parenthood has been a leading provider of reproductive and sexual health services in New York City. We're a trusted name in healthcare and believe that high quality healthcare is a human right, regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, race, or income. Historically, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming individuals have experienced inadequate access to care. This disparity still persists today. 
In the 2011 National Transgender Discrimination Survey, 28% of individuals reported having been harassed by medical providers because of their transgender identity, while 19% reported that they were refused medical care because of their transgender identity. These findings confirm widespread systemic and societal discrimination against transgender individuals within healthcare settings and exemplify the need for a medical school curriculum that includes implicit bias related to all aspects of an individual's identity. Presently, medical students in the United States are taught the impacts of stereotyping, racial biases, and gender-related assumptions and how these personal shortcomings affect patient care and access to care. This curriculum does not take into account the biases and prejudices that healthcare professionals may have towards LGB and TGNC patient populations, nor do they address the harboring of bias towards LGBTQ patient sexual practices. As a sexual and reproductive health care organization, PPNYC has actively addressed the dispar disparities mentioned above and taken steps to create a welcoming environment for our patients. These efforts include revising our protocols and interactions with patients to create a more inclusive environment. At any PPNYC health center, a patient is asked their pronouns and affirming name at the front desk during their very first interaction with any PPNYC healthcare professional. This policy was implemented to ensure that all staff are familiar with the patient's identity and are addressing them accordingly. Our healthcare professionals are trained and equipped with information about the differences between sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, informing the manner in which they interact with our patients. We believe by using appropriate terminology, such as transgender or cisgender, we avoid alienating any individual or group of individuals and normalizing any one identity. We also endeavor to meet our patients where they are to ensure that we are equipped with information to appropriately treat, support, and, and support patients uh, that experience health disparities. As such, PPNYC has adopted policies to obtaining an accurate medical and sexual history for each of our patients, including asking them sexual orientation and gender identity questions and restructured sexual behavior and risk evaluation questions to have conversations about sexual behavior free from assumptions and stereotypes. The healthcare industry has a long history of treating certain groups of people and behaviors as normal while alienating others. This has resulted in generations of mistrust in and mistreatment by medical providers. When we look towards strengthening our communities, it's imperative that access to culturally competent healthcare is easily accessible to all. PPNYC is confident that if implemented correctly, a mandatory implicit bias training will result in a better understanding of how prejudice undermines equitable care and how healthcare providers can actively deconstruct notions that jeopardize access to care. Reso 512 and the development of statewide standards will, will improve the quality of care throughout New York State. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Schuyler. I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for, 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 for the Public Interest, the, the, the Disability Justice Program. Um, I'm, I am a person who stutters. Uh, patients w w w w w w w with disabilities experience gr 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 greater barriers to health care th than patients without disabilities. Among the reasons for, 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 for this disparity, are the implicit biases held by, by medical providers. Training medical students in identifying implicit bias, as called for in Resolution 512, is a critical step to elevate the quality of care, of med, um, the quality of medical care available for, 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 for patients with disabilities. Section heading one. Patients with disabilities face myriad barriers to medical care. Generally speaking, people with disabilities are two and a half times more likely to have unmet health care needs than, than their non-disabled peers and are more likely to suffer from a terminal condition that, 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 may, affect, that, that may have been detected earlier through the, the disease pre prevention screening. Particularly affected, however, by, by the disparity in access are women with disabilities, especially in the, in the area of cancer screening. To, to, to give a sense of the numbers, 61% of, 
of women with disabilities reported having, having mammograms, while 74% of women without disabilities received this test. For, 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 for pap tests, 65% of women with disabilities received pap tests compared to 83% of women without disabilities. S such significant l l lack of access to critical services leads to poor health outcomes for, 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 for women with disabilities, including higher mortality rates. It is also suggested that, that, that racial minorities with disabilities experience disproportionate barriers to health care. While relatively little is known about the health status of individuals uh, with disabilities who are also members of racial or ethnic minorities, reports for, 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 for from the, the CDC on the health status of people living with disabilities along racial lines show that people of color present with poor health at a higher frequency than Caucasians and racial um, and racial ethnic minorities um, and racial and ethnic minorities have historically been and continue to be disproportionately impacted by health disparities. Inaccessibility to health care affects people uh, with disabilities on every level of their lives, so, so, so socially, psychologically, f physically, and economically. So, so, so section heading two, ne 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 negative impact of structural environmental barriers to medical care for patients with disabilities. The, there, there are two primary causes for, for, for the disparity in health care faced by persons with disabilities. Structural environmental barriers and process barriers. Structural environmental barriers include types of services offered, uh, accessibility of provider offices and diagnostic equipment, and insurance coverage. Process barriers include medical provider implicit bias and their lack of knowledge in treating patients with disabilities. We strongly support the fact that, 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 that Resolution 512 addresses process barriers as conscious and unconscious biases held by healthcare providers are another underlying aspect of identified barriers to healthcare access for, for people with disabilities, as well as other marginalized groups such as, as racial and ethnic minorities. N n n n negative stereotypes held by um, healthcare providers translate into lower quality and fewer services provided, as well as contributing to poor health, health uh, outcomes for, 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 for these groups of people. However, re 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 Resolution 512 makes no mention of the equally uh, critical structural environmental barriers, not, notwithstanding the fact that such barriers present significant and continuing impediments uh, to, to receiving appropriate health care. We urge the, the immediate addition of language acknowledging and condemning such structural environmental barriers. So, 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 section heading three, training medical school uh, students to recognize will, uh, bias will improve medical access for people with disabilities. Adding implicit bias trainings to medical school curriculums will for, 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 for first and foremost, start a valuable discussion about treating patients with disabilities. Simply bringing awareness to, to, to medical providers about the challenges people with disabilities face in accessing healthcare is significant, as physicians have not received training on the fundamental aspects of working with people with disabilities. In a 2007 survey of primary care physicians, 91% of them revealed that they had never received training on how to serve people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. According to, to, to a national study of physicians, only 2.6% of respondents demonstrated specific awareness of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Another survey of more than 500 physicians revealed that, that nearly 20% of respondents were unaware of the ADA and more than 45% 40, did, did not know about its architectural requirements. Moreover, 
less than a quarter of the respondents had received any training uh, on physical disability issues in medical school. And, and only slightly more than a third had received any kind of training on disability d d during the, the, the residency. However, n n n nearly three quarters of physicians surveyed acknowledged a need for, for, for training on these issues. So, 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 such trainings will, will also lead to increased awareness of medical equipment and procedures av um, available for, for people with disabilities. Th th there is a significant correlation between the knowledge about accessibility and the provision of accessible equipment in healthcare clinics. Y yet, in one study, only 46% of healthcare administrators in clinical practices knew that accessible equipment existed, and only 25% were able to, to describe accessible equipment. While 44% of administrators had considered purchasing accessible equipment at some point, only 22% knew of the federal tax credit program that assists businesses in complying with the legal mandates to do so. Moreover, open discussion about implicit bias at medical schools will encourage future medical providers to, to publicly identify as people with disabilities. Medical pro professionals are hesitant to identify as people with disabilities for, for, for fear of stigma and, dam and damaging the, 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 their career prospects. Having bias training in the curriculum will set the stage for, 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 for medical professionals to identify as people with disabilities and in turn to, to take a larger role in advocating for, for, for medical access issues concerning disability. Trainings on implicit bias will, will also increase the disability literacy or making one's language, knowledge, and interactions reflective of understanding disability experiences and disability etiquette. Increasing the, the level of disability literacy among uh, medical providers in turn will, will lessen the barriers to medical access for people with disabilities. So, 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 section heading four, r r r r r r r recommendations. New York Lawyers for, for the Public Interest respectfully request the New York City Council Hospitals Committee to modify R R R R R R R R Resolution 512 uh, as follows. Add people with, with disabilities to the list of traditionally marginalized communities uh, in the first paragraph. Um, Add a paragraph, so, so summarizing the, the statistical disparities faced by people with disabilities with an emphasis on structural environmental barriers as set forth above. M mandate training regarding removal of structural environmental barriers. Um, in, in, in conclusion, Thank you for the opportunity to, to, to testify today about these key issues affecting uh, appropriate medical care for, 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 for people with, with, with disabilities. Uh, please feel free to contact me. I look forward to, to, to discussing this further. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you for your recommendations. Um, I, changes to the RESO itself are totally a possibility and I don't think I've ever seen a resolution with this much response to how we can improve the language itself, which I think speaks volumes for how important it is. So thank you, thank you to all of you. I, I do have one last addition. Um, uh, so if, I just wanna let you, thank you, thank you to the panel. I wanna make sure you get a chance to go, thank you. Greg Waltman. Good afternoon, my name is Greg Waltman. Um, represent uh, 
G1 Quantum Clean Energy Company, um, Councilman Rivera, um, General Counsel. Nice to see you. Um, just adding to the conversation around disability and the way the city allocates funds to help those that need more assistance. You know, we've been going around quite some time now with solutions, contractual solutions on the solar wall, different types of applications, quantum tracks, and you're, you know, although the conversation and dialogue is somewhat constructive when I'm here, it seems that there is no follow through. And, and when we build upon implicit bias, what is the difference between implicit bias and censorship as it relates to people with disabilities? Because for value, it seems like, okay, well, we don't like the dialogue or the narrative or the solution, so we're just gonna parse it out and censor it, which is an inherently implicit bias. So when someone's presenting a superior course of action to the council and the council, like yourself, takes it into consideration, but then out, outside of the council or extenuating value factors play into the council's ability or limit it, it becomes somewhat frustrating. It must be to be, you know, execute or, or have to execute these types of dialogues with the public, but when in reality there are other types of fiscal solutions that are more constructive and productive. So I, I was just building upon that, so with the hope that, you know, as we progress forward and the Green New Deal scams and those types of things are parsed and broken down and these value narratives are further broken down and the mayor has more time now that he's not running for president, that we can actually bring these solutions to fruition and actually reach the type of outcomes so we can fill the gaps and budgetary concerns so people with disabilities get the funds they need and people that aren't disabled aren't forced onto disability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any more, any other members of the public that wish to testify today? Seeing none, I, I just want to thank um, everyone who uh, stuck with us and thank you for your testimony. I think we all agree uh, conclusively that mandatory implicit bias training is absolutely necessary, but only if it's coupled with structural reforms, but only if it's coupled with having the conversation about racism and discrimination that takes place inside our facilities and even the, the lack of conversation inside of in our, our schools. So institutionalized racism is real. We're hoping that we can move forward with a constructive dialogue that allows us to uh, make sure that everybody has equitable access. And so with that, I'm going to adjourn this hearing. Thank you so much.